Welcome to Five Good Questions. I'm your host, Jake Taylor. Our guest today is Suzanne Haywood. Suzanne is a managing director of Exor. She started her professional career in the UK government at the Treasury and was a senior partner at McKinsey. She's also a board member of CNH Industrial and The Economist. She has an MA from Oxford and a PhD from Cambridge. Today we're going to be discussing her book, Reorg, How to Get It Right. Suzanne is an expert in organizational practices. Let's ask her five good questions. Welcome back to the show, everybody. My guest today is Suzanne Haywood, author of Reorg. Suzanne, thanks for taking the time to be with us. Thanks very much for inviting me. So, you know, this is kind of a topic that um, is certainly, maybe not everyone is is in the middle of a reorg, but at some point or another, if you're a leader, it's probably going to come up for you. Um, so, you know, maybe this will find someone just when they needed to, to hear about it. Um, so let's jump in right to question number one. What are the keys to effective communication with employees during a reorg? So this one is really important and we spent quite a lot of time when we were doing the book thinking about it and in fact in the end we ended up doing a whole chapter separately on the issue of communication because it's one of the things that often goes wrong during a reorg. Um, because people, well for, actually the biggest thing that goes wrong is people assume that people aren't going to find out about it. So they often establish a little team near the CEO's office busy thinking about how to reorganize the company and they somehow think that people aren't going to know. And usually that lasts for about a week and then everybody knows. And as you can imagine, that's the worst possible way of communicating what you're doing because everybody assumes it's going to be absolutely terrible. You know, there's a kind of secret team hiding away and they're coming up with some dastardly plan. And it's all going to be a disaster. So the things that we advise, the key things are, first of all, be honest. So as early as possible, tell people that it's happening. You may not be able to tell them what the answer is. In fact, you probably can't, but you can tell them broadly what you're trying to do, so why are you reorganizing, you can tell them broadly the time scale for it, and importantly you can give them some sort of sense of when they're going to know what the answer is. So you can say by the summer or by Christmas or whatever it's going to be, we'll be able to give you an indication of you know, how we're going to change the organization, you know, by the spring we'll be able to tell you exactly what is going to happen for each individual job or whatever it's going to be. So give people a sense and be honest that it's happening. That's the first principle. So basically like stamping out as much ambiguity as you can with whatever you have. Absolutely, absolutely. And just because you can't tell people everything, don't tell them nothing because that, that really, really scares people. I think the second thing is often when people do reorganization communications programs, they think about all sorts of stakeholders. They think about what they might say to regulators, what they might say to customers, what they might say to other companies. You have to put the employees first. They're the most important people to communicate to. In fact, one of the things that we found that often goes wrong in reorganizations is that people leave and they leave because of uncertainty. So put them, put them first. Um, the other kind of couple of things which I think are important is frequency. So once you've made that first announcement, you've told people that it's happening, you actually have to keep them updated quite regularly. And again, don't be put off doing this if you don't have very much to say. So even if all you can say is the work's continuing, there's not very much to tell you at the moment, you know, but, you know, we've just run a survey. Thank you very much for all the survey results. We're busy kind of processing those or whatever it is. Give people a sense that you're still communicating, that the channels are still open. And then the last thing is, um, as far as you can, set up some sort of process for engagement with employees. So whether that's some sort of online forum where people can engage and send in questions. Um, often when I've done them, we've done a, a kind of survey where people can give give you ideas for how to change the organization or what's working or what's not working, you know, give them a phone number they can ring, you know, go and do focus groups, there's all sorts of things that you can do to engage people. And again, it makes the whole process a lot less scary and also you learn a lot as you're doing it. So those, those are the big principles. Gotcha. Um, so question number two, could you walk us through what a successful reorg looks like and, you know, a, I mean, obviously, we just covered kind of the communication component of it from the employees, but but kind of what are the steps that, that you'd expect to follow to give you the best chance of having a successful reorg? Well, we've tried to keep it relatively simple in the book. And, and I should say the idea behind the book is not to try and come up with some great new idea that nobody's ever thought about, but really to lay out in fairly simple clear terms, what are the things that you should try and do during a reorg and what are the things that you should avoid doing? So we actually talk about what are the success factors and what are the pitfalls in each step. 
uh, we've got five steps um, and in some ways that the steps are not magic you you know when I kind of walk through them in a moment you'll think well they feel quite obvious mm -hmm. but it's amazing how often they get skipped and how often these steps don't happen so the first one is what we, what we talk about is, is setting up a really clear view of the costs and benefits of the reorganization. It's amazing how often that doesn't happen. So, you know, there's quite a few reorganizations that I've come into where I've said, well, why are we doing this reorganization? And somebody said, well, it's because the CEO's just come in and he, it's often he, he's decided <laughs> that we need to reorganize. Uh, and that's not a good reason to reorganize. Uh, you've got to have a really good sense of why on earth are we doing it, what are the benefits we're going to try and get from it, and do we have a clear sense of what the costs are going to be. And some of those benefits and some of those costs are going to be qualitative, not quantitative. It's going to be very hard to put a number against them, but it doesn't matter. Still write them down and be very clear what they are. It's important for making the decision to go ahead, but it's also really important because you'll see at a later step when you want to work out whether or not the reorganization has worked, you want to come back to that cost benefit and work out whether or not you've actually delivered what you said you were going to deliver. Mm -hmm. So that's step one. Step two is get a really good understanding of the strengths and weaknesses of the current organization before you jump into the answer. Uh, this is a very good moment to engage employees. We talked a moment ago about engaging employees. Uh, often the top of an organization, the CEO, the top team, doesn't have a very good sense of the strengths and weaknesses. You want to understand it at quite a kind of granular level. The third step is to come up with your options. So what are you going to do? What, what's going to change? Um, and here the key thing is not to jump to a single answer too quickly. And often what I found is you walk in, I'm afraid often it's the CEO's office or the head of HR's office, and on their whiteboard they will have drawn up, here's the answer, you know, kind of Bob's going to report to Roberta and so and so. And then what they want you to do is they want you to come up with 101 different reasons why that's the right answer. And as you can imagine, it's not, it's not a good way to do a reorganization. What you want is you want two or three options. And you want to be able to play off those options against each other and really develop the pros and cons around them and then come to a decision. Again, it's a great moment uh, to get employees involved and engaged, particularly senior employees at this point, uh, engaged and really thinking about the costs and benefits of, of different approaches. Once you've got that right, the real problem is that's step three. Uh, we've, we've got our costs and benefits sorted, uh, we've thought about the strengths and weaknesses, we've laid out the different options. Danger now is that people declare victory and say, right, that's it, you know, we've come up with the answer, let's move ahead. Uh, but actually, the really detailed work goes on now, what we kind of call the plumbing and wiring. You've got to redo the job descriptions, you've got to work out how the processes are going to change, there's a lot of work to be done, it's probably the biggest step at that point. And then finally, we've got a step where we call, which we call launch and course correct. And this is the bit where you go back to the costs and benefits and say, well, have we actually delivered what we were going to deliver? Often it's the case that you haven't completely and you need to do some adjustment to make it work. So those are the five steps. Um, and in the book, what we try to do is just highlight some of the big pitfalls in each step and some of the things that you should do to try and get through each one as smoothly as possible. Has it been your experience that... Um... <clears throat> with having sort of a process laid out, um, does that really help with morale as far as, um, you know, because you kind of see it going one of two ways. Like potentially there's those who realize that there's problems and they're going to be excited that their fixes are coming. And then there's obviously the other side of it with all, all the uncertainty where people are become disengaged and maybe even like destructive, um, you know, with the, as far as the social fabric of the company goes. What's What's been your experience with that? Well, we actually did quite a lot of uh, survey work trying to work out what goes wrong when people do reorganizations. And actually, the number one thing that goes wrong is that you get passive resistance and actually passive resistance amongst the leadership team. So you get people who say that that's a great idea. They say publicly, but in private, they say to their staff, yeah, I don't know why we're doing this. It doesn't make any sort of sense. Just keep on doing everything tomorrow in the same way that you used to do it yesterday. Uh, passive resistance. The best remedy for the passive resistance is engagement. Yeah, if people are involved in the process, they tend not to be passively resistant, even if the answer is not the answer that they wanted. So if they're involved in trying to create the answer, they're much more likely to accept what it is, whatever whatever it's going to be. But that that's the biggest danger is that people resist it. They look yeah. like they're they're okay, but they, they they're not. <laughs> Putting on a brave face. Yeah. Um, 
So question number three, what's the 20, 30, 50 rule of thumb? And maybe how did that sort of uh, come to be? Well, so what we've often found is when you get to that fourth step, which is laying out the plumbing and the wiring, and you're really starting to think about what this new organization looks like, there's a bit of, temp of a temptation to lift all the people that sit in the current organization and put them all back into the new organization in almost identical jobs to what they had before. And it's a bit of a missed opportunity. Um, at the point at which you're shaking up an organization, and we all know that people hate change, it's a good opportunity to really think about whether or not you've got the right people and the right sort of roles. Because you don't want to do it again later, you want to do it once. So our kind of rule of thumb, and it is literally a rule of thumb, so it does, it's not always right, but it's a useful rule of thumb to kind of check, is that you want to keep about 50% of the people in similar roles to what they had before. You should be moving about 30% of the people. So in other words, they're the same people, but they're doing different roles. Um, and by the way, that's another good remedy against passive resistance. So somebody who's very resistant in an old role, you move them into a new role in the new structure, and often they change their, their view quite radically. Uh, and then you should be ideally looking to bring in about 20% of new talent. Because it's a great, you know, usually when you're reorganizing, you're reorganizing for some sort of strategic purpose. Uh, and that's what you, when we talked about right at the start, the costs and benefits of the reorganization, the benefits are often around a strategic objective. Now, that strategic objective may be moving into a new country or a new service line or a new product, or it may be downsizing. Um, but often you need some different talent to be able to take you there. So that's the 20, uh, 30, 50 rule. Look for 20% new talent, move 30% of the people, keep 50% of the people in exactly the same roles. It's a rule of thumb, but you know, if you look at your new organization and it's 90% exactly the same as it was before, kind you're probably not going to, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you're probably going to end up doing tomorrow exactly what you did yesterday. Yeah. So uh, question number four, and this covered a little bit about some of the biggest mistakes and why reorgs fail, um, you know, not communicating, uh, not taking advantage of when you have it, um, sort of ripping the Band-Aid off um, in a way. Um, but what else can go wrong um, when you're, what, what's the most common pitfalls that, uh, that you've seen? So the biggest pitfall is the lack of engagement and therefore yeah. people being passively resistant. So we talked about that one already. Some of the other ones, ignoring the detail. So we talked about in that fourth step, the, the, the fact that you've really got to get in there and think about how you change the processes, how you change the job descriptions and everything else. We've tried to make this a little bit easier for people by laying out some of the things that, that people need to go through to get a reorganization to land well. Uh, poor communications, which we started on, and it was a good place to start. Poor communications, and if you don't do that well, I've seen organizations go through change and lose some of their best talent. Um, in fact, one very good technique on this one is to identify as a leadership group who your top talent are. And usually in an organization, you know who that is. You know, there's a group of 20, 30, 40 people who are absolutely critical for the organization. They may not be the most senior people, but they're sitting in important roles. They're your future talent. And you can often run quite an informal process whereby in, in the UK anyway, you go and have a cup of tea with them. Uh, in the US, you may go and have a kind of Starbucks with them, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But you effectively say to them, you're important for this organization. I can't guarantee to you what your role is going to be at the end of it, but I want you to know that you're important. And I've seen organizations that do that as an informal process. Their chance of losing those people goes down, go down radically because, you know, you feel loved even though you don't quite know what the outcome is going to be. Um, uh, so those are the really important things. I think the um, the only other one which I would highlight is the importance of thinking not just about structure. So some reorganizations are literally about changing reporting lines. So Bob reported to Roberta, Bob is now going to report to Alison. Now, the problem with that is if you go two levels down from Bob, the fact that Bob is now reporting to Alison rather than Roberta is not going to change what I do when I come into the office tomorrow. Mm -hmm. It doesn't change anything at all for me. The thing that changes what I do is if you change the processes in the organization, you change the systems in the organization. So you've got to think about those elements and not just about structure. It's very easy when you sit at the top of an organization to think that by changing the structure, you change everything. But actually, the structure is just an enabler. The systems and the processes and the culture are actually much more important for making the organization behave differently. 
Right, the people are interacting probably in their same ways, no matter what the org chart says. Exactly, they, exactly. They go to the same person for something that they need. and. <laughs> That's right. But if you change the process, that changes. So if you say, you know, we're now going to have a process that works like this rather than like that, that changes. Or if you change the culture, it changes. Yeah. yeah. So question number five, if let's, if you do have to let someone go, that maybe that unfortunate 20% that, uh, that gets is on mm. the chopping block, what, what are some keys to doing it in the most humane and, um, you know, classy way that, that you can? Yes, and, and you're right to highlight this because it is one of the consequences of many reorganizations. And I think it's really, really important to treat people well who are going to leave the organization because they will they will remember for the rest of their careers how you treated them. And it will have a big impact on both them personally and on the reputation of the organization. So it's really, really important. Um, the big things are, I think, honesty. So being really honest with people about why this is happening. Um, Often it's not about the individual performance, it's about the changing needs of the organization. Um, I think you can do a lot to support people in finding new opportunities. Uh, for example, I worked with a company where they paid for everybody who was going to leave the organization had career counseling outside of the organization, help doing a CV. You know, those sorts of things I think are not that expensive and make a huge difference in terms of people feeling supported when the organization goes through this change. Um, it's, of, it's often not a mandatory requirement for the organization to do it, but it, it, leaves, it leaves people feeling a little bit much more supported. Um, treating people with respect. So this is about being really confidential about the processes. Um, you know, you shouldn't, you, you, you should never declare that people are leaving the organization because of performance reasons in a public way. You know, that's a private conversation between somebody and their line manager. You know, they have to leave and have their respect intact. Um, and then the last thing is do it quickly. So if you know that roles are going to disappear and the opportunity, there isn't an opportunity for somebody, be honest with them as quickly as possible so they can get on with their life and you can provide them with the support to move on. I think those would be my four key principles. So being honest, supporting them as much as you can, um, treating them with respect so they leave with their heads held high and doing it as quickly as you can. I think that, uh, you know, back in my corporate days, I, there was a, I've been a part of a couple of reorgs and I think one of the interesting things was the that the other employees that were still there they really cared about how the other people were downsized mm -hmm. um and it it had lasting impacts um depending on if it was done well or not um so it's not even just about treating that person well on the way out which is just the right thing to do but also the employees who are left like they notice what happens to their kind of family member and they they care about that mm -hmm. Well, apart from anything else, you know that that could be you in another couple of years. So if you see people being treated with respect, you're much more likely to stay in the organization because you trust that, you know, should that happen to you, you'll also be treated by with respect and treated well. What was, uh, just out of curiosity maybe, what was the one of the most radically um, generous or, or just cool ways that, that a company has handled that? You know, maybe it's not for everybody, but just something where you're like, wow, that was pretty pretty impressive that they went to that length to to make that person feel good on the way out well so, so the best things i've seen is where you see the senior management really take a lot of time with the individuals so sometimes in an organization what they do is they cascade everything down so i'm spoken to by my line manager but i've seen organizations where the ceo literally sits down with you know large numbers of the people who are leaving and talks to them individually, explains to them why it's happening. Um, and people really, really appreciate that because they know CEOs don't have a lot of time, but taking that time and, and being kind of generous, I think is important. And as I say, some of the smaller things like this career counseling point, um, you know, the, the, often within contracts, you've got you know, mandatory payoffs that people have to be paid. Certainly in the Europe, there's lots of things around how much you have to pay people if, if you make them redundant. Um, but it's these little things that you can put on top, uh, particularly things that support people. Um, I've also seen situations where people have gone out of their way to help people find opportunities, providing introductions to other companies, all that sort of thing. Little things in those kind of moments of vulnerability when people are looking for new opportunities, that, that's what people remember. Great. So our bonus question we always ask, and this is for a book recommendation. Uh, what do you have for us today? 
Well, one of the books that I love, which I have given out to a lot of people, is a book by uh, Chip and Dan Heath. It's called Decisive. And the reason why I like it is, first of all, it's a nice short book. I like nice short books. Uh, And what it basically does is it lays out some of the fallacies, some of the things that we do wrong when we make decisions. Uh, And this, by the way, is not just in a business context, but in a personal context as well. So one of the things that, for example, we tend to do is we tend to, and this applies to reorganizations, we tend to come up with an answer very early. So take an M&A situation. An M&A situation, CEO wants to buy another company. Very quickly, although people don't admit it, the decision is made. We're going to buy that company. Mm -hmm. And everybody is then working towards, you know, how can we afford it, justifying it, you know, that, you know, golly, it's expensive, but it's got to be a good idea and so on and so on. Uh, And of course, a lot of advisors that a company will have are also very incentivized to make that acquisition go ahead. So one of the things that Chip and Dan Heath advise is something called a black hat team, where you actually mandate a team of people in the organization to come up with a counter proposal. So your job is to go away and tell us why we shouldn't buy that company. And by releasing them from the obligation of giving a nice kind of balanced, reasonable argument, and and they kind of know that the answer should be, yes, we should buy it. Mm -hmm. You often find people get very creative and that leads to a really good discussion where you then pose the the kind of the two counter arguments together. And I've used that technique actually a number of times. Um, For example, you know, one of the other things I do is I'm quite involved in the Opera House here in London. And we've recently started a major rebuild project, a big uh, 50 million pound rebuild project. And before that started, we went through one of these exercises where we wrote a paper, which was here's all the reasons why we shouldn't do this project. And here's all the reasons why. Why we should do this project and then having done that we decided to go ahead but actually we went ahead with much more kind of awareness of some of the reasons why it was going to be a risky thing to do so it was very helpful so i do recommend the book and it's very short which is great perfect that's a great recommendation <laughs> well suzanne uh, appreciate your time coming on the show and uh thank you for sharing everything thank you very much for inviting me i loved it absolutely thanks for watching i hope you enjoyed this interview If you'd like to support this author and purchase their book, click here. If you'd like to become a subscriber to 5GQ, click here. And I included a couple other interviews that you might appreciate right here. Thanks, happy reading.